All right, let's get underway. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Bill Shambra, Senior Fellow at Hudson Institute. And on behalf of Pablo Eisenberg and myself, it's an honor to welcome you to a book discussion with Lindsay McGoey, author of No Such Thing as a Free Gift, The Gates Foundation and the Price of Philanthropy, uh, published by Verso Press. Our thanks as well to the co-host of today's event, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, for whom uh, Pablo and I both write uh, occasionally, and a special welcome to our viewers on C-SPAN Book TV. Uh, some time ago, Hudson introduced to the world a series informally known as The Pablo and Bill Show, uh, in which Pablo Eisenberg uh, and I host a, a discussion of a book discussion of possible interest to the foundation and nonprofit world. Pablo, for those of you who don't know him, is aptly described by Professor McGoey as a doyen of U.S. philanthropy. I think doyen is French for pain in the neck uh, and, and something of a, a, folk hero, a folk hero for grassroots nonprofits. Uh, Pablo and I launched our series in, in February 2014, featuring a conversation with Nina Monk, author of The Idealist, uh, Jeffrey Sachs and the Quest to End Poverty. So we're doing one panel every year and a half or so. That's, a, that's a, the, the <laughs> pace that we seem to be setting. Uh, at any rate, the book before us today deals with a philanthropic approach, philanthrocapitalism, uh, especially as practiced by Bill Gates that might be described as an amalgam of the most soaring idealism and the most self-interested pragmatism, but with goals every bit as grand as ending poverty. The three of us will talk about the book for 40 or 45 minutes or so, and then we'll see questions from our knowledgeable audience. Dr. McGoey is a senior lecturer in, sociologist, uh, in sociology at the University of Essex, and in spite of that, writes in a marvelously fluent, jargon-free, <laughs> and publicly accessible way. Now, Professor McGoy, your book refreshingly acknowledges that today's philanthro-capitalism may not be the brand new, unprecedented, change the world phenomenon it claims to be. Uh, and you, you uh, uh, acknowledge that by comparing and contrasting philanthrocapitalism to the philanthropy of Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, maybe you could start off by telling us a bit uh, about how you view it being the same, how is it different, and how does the public reception of the two uh, eras of philanthropy, how, do, how does the public reception compare and contrast? Sure. Thanks, Bill. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. All week, I've been, doing, I've been doing a few talks over in North America and vastly disappointing people with my accent, I think, because I live and work in Essex, and I think people might have been expecting a British accent, but as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Toronto. Uh, no. <laughs> And I, I live in what's not considered a very thriving metropolis of Colchester, working for a few years on a book that um, I came to from a background in global health. So it's incredibly exciting to be here amongst experts who I've been drawing on for the past few years. And I'm hoping to learn as much from, from you, really, as, as anything I'll be able to impart today. One often hears the claim that we're living in a golden period of philanthropic giving. And I think that this claim is based in part in the fact that the size of large endowments with a particular emphasis on the Gates Foundation seems to dwarf the magnitude of endowments that we've seen in the past. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has an endowment of about 40 billion US dollars. It disperses approximately $3 billion cumulatively to its three different main priority areas, which are U.S. primary and secondary education, global health, and global health, global agriculture and development. That amount of three billion is not quite as much as the annual operating budget of the World Health Organization, but it's on par with the UN World Health Organization's overall budget of about four billion. The Gates Foundation also provides about 10% of the WHO's overall budget. 
and it's the second largest donor to the, to the WHO after the U.S. government. Its influence on the WHO is such that we recently had Lori Garrett, who's a, a very well-known health scholar, suggesting in foreign affairs that currently at the WHO, there are no major high-level policy decisions implemented without being, as she put it, casually, unofficially vetted by the Gates Foundation. So we have a situation where a, a U.S. organization is seen as wielding unprecedented influence over some of the largest UN bodies. And yet, at the same time, just how large is the Gates Foundation in comparison to earlier foundations when it comes to a proportionate share of the U.S. GDP? Are we really living in a golden period of philanthropy when it comes to overall philanthropic investment? And some people would suggest, regarding the second question, that we're not, potentially. Internationally, global giving is increasing. We're seeing a spike in philanthropic bequests in some of the BRIC nations, Russia, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, where a surge in growing wealth concentration does seem to be resulting and is empirically, observably resulting in increased philanthropic giving. In the US, on the other hand, cumulative giving from both foundations and private individuals has stayed stable at about 2% of the GDP since the 1970s. We also know that we're living in a period of growing wealth inequality domestically in the UK and the US. So there's this question of whether or not global, growing global internet increases in philanthropic giving, in what ways is this helping to mitigate growing inequality, and in what ways could it be potentially exacerbating it? With that goal in mind, my book tries to compare what is novel about new philanthropic giving in comparison to the past, with a specific emphasis on what's been called philanthrocapitalism. Speak for two or three more minutes about what philanthrocapitalism is, how it diverges from earlier forms of philanthropic giving or doesn't before we can hopefully go into a more interactive Q&A. Who here is familiar with the term philanthrocapitalism? This most is a very room. knowledgeable audience, <laughs> I'm sure most of them most are. Most of the room. <laughs> Coined by Matthew Bishop and Michael Green, expanded in a book published in 2008, Philanthrocapitalism, How the Rich Can Save the World. It was published in the fall of 2008, just as Bear Stearns was going up under, and a second edition was swiftly published, Philanthrocapitalism, How Giving Can Save the World. I don't think the emphasis on the rich, in other words, was particularly seen as a helpful time to publish a book, which was calling attention to the, what Bishop and Green see as the unique acumen of tech billionaires to essentially solve some of the world's most intractable problems. Bishop and Green suggest that two things are novel to what they describe as a new philanthrocapitalist movement. First, they argue that there's a novel emphasis on trying to measure the results of philanthropic giving through applying the tools of, say, cost-benefit cost analysis and other forms of metrics in order to understand just how impactful different forms of giving are. Secondly, they say that philanthropists are increasingly trying to apply the for-profit motive to philanthropic giving by purposely blurring the realms of the nonprofit and for-profit world in order to achieve more social good. My book argues essentially two things. The first point is not nearly as new as is purported by Bishop and Green. The effort to try to adopt a more strategic, rational, impact-oriented, cost -bet beneficially cost-effective philanthropy is novel, but it's novel to the turn of the 20th century not the 21st century. It was the key aim of, of philanthropists such as Rockefeller and Carnegie to apply the tools of corporate growth to the realm of philanthropic giving in order to distinguish charity from a form of Christian almsgiving that was seen as virtuous in itself regardless of measurable impact. So that was a key explicit aim of people like Rockefeller and, Carne and Carnegie as Bill, as Pablo, as other scholars like Benjamin Soskis have long described. On the other hand, the idea that we are increasingly seeing a for-profit turn in philanthropy is, I think, novel. And it's something that we can see in a few different ways, including an increase in direct giving through non-repayable grants to recipients 
like MasterCard and Vodacom by the Gates Foundation, a trend that I can elaborate as we go on. Good. I think I'll stop there yeah. for okay. now. And Excellent. Pablo, do you have anything to, to add? or? No, I just am curious. Uh, the scholars at Boston College have predicted that within 20 to 30 years, we're going to see the growth of many, many more mega foundations, the size of the Waltons or <clears throat> the Gates Foundation, maybe 20, 30, with huge endowments of 30, 40, 50 um, billion dollars. Now, given your account of the lack of accountability uh, with the Gates Foundation and others, um, and the fact that uh, access uh, is limited, that criticism is muted, do you see this phenomenal growth in mega foundations as a threat to, Democrat, to democracy, to democratic institutions? I think the non-accountability issue is the, the gravest problem and conundrum raised, raised by the, the size and the sheer influence of bodies like the Gates Foundation. By committing 10% of the World Health Organization's budget, in essence, in a number of ways that I can elaborate upon, but one of the reasons why this is a concern is that 70 years, uh, a few, uh, 30 years ago, about 70% of the World Health Organization's budget came from what were called assessed contributions. These were contributions made by member states and that were given to a pooled fund that the World Health Organization had jurisdiction over dispersing. So it essentially could allocate that 70% overall portion of its budget in a manner that it thought was most effective and it was able to decide upon in a relatively democratic way, which is that the World Health Organization has annual assemblies where member states join and debate and vote on key policies. So there is some level of uh, democratic process that has to be followed. In the past 30 years, we've seen a significant shift in that now 70% of the World Health Organization's budget comes from what are called voluntary contributions, both from member states as well as from bodies like the Gates Foundation. Those voluntary contributions can be stipulated for specific causes and programs that are that are indicated and directed by the donors themselves. And we've seen a number of global health scholars suggest empirically that there's good evidence that these voluntary contributions are much less aligned with global burdens of disease than the assessed contributions. So we're, we've seen a problem that the World Health Organization's priority setting has been in many ways distorted and in some ways perverted by the rise of voluntary contributions, which at face value seem irreproachable, because how can we argue against giving money to something as important as global health? But at the same time, the way it's been donated has been done in a way that might be causing more disruption, more unhelpful disruption at the World Health Organization than is useful. So the Ga Ms. in a way, Mr. Gates, though I think he is extremely well-intentioned, He's become, in a way, a sort of unofficial global health czar. He's been called the shadow education secretary of the United States. And though I don't think he's ever received any money for this sort of uh, spokesman, spokesmanship, he in some ways does act as a sort of honorific diplomatic envoy on behalf of corporations like Coca-Cola and to some extent Monsanto in sub-Saharan Africa and he was never elected or appointed to do so. So it does raise some serious questions surrounding accountability. Well, the, the interesting thing, um, just following up your, the, the point about the impact on global health, uh, you use an example of, of the focus on polio. Maybe you could sort of make this a little more concrete by describing that a bit. In other words, again, who can argue with the goal of eliminating polio? Uh, and that seemed to be something that, that the Gates Foundation was particularly taken by. But describe the unintended consequences, if you will, of that, of that focus for a moment. Sure. The polio campaign, eradication campaign, has been ongoing since prior to the inception of the Gates Foundation. So it was something that was spearheaded in part by the Rotary Club, yeah. and it was passed in a motion by the WHO, and I think it was 86, but it was certainly the mid-80s, that following the successful eradication of small, smallpox, 
the WHO was essentially canvassing for trying to determine if there was another infectious disease, infectious virus that could be combated through the similar tools and strategies that were used to eradicate smallpox. <laughs> when the motion passed at the WHO to try to tackle polio next, Historians have shown, global health scholars have shown, that it was an initiative that was very much spearheaded by wealthy nations and not poor ones. Polio was still a problem to a certain extent in developing nations, but not nearly as much as a problem of certain of other <laughs> health ailments. It was something that was seen as, an, as possibly an easy success, and therefore wealthy nations felt that money and funds should be directed to a polio eradication effort. Developing countries signed on rather reluctantly and suggested that they can provide some in-country in, in support as long as there was a huge financial contribution made by wealthy ones. What Mr. Gates has done has taken forward the polio eradication campaign in a way that commands political support and attention to an effort that increasingly people think might be in some ways counterproductive from a cost perspective and that it places an incredible burden on developing regions who are actually having to pay more of their health budget than was initially expected in order to combat an ailment that only affects around 300 people annually in new transmission rates and is only endemic in three nations, uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and it was recently we had a full year in Nigeria where Nigeria was polio free. So there's this concern that polio campaigns command a lot of public support in the West, but aren't actually a major priority in poor regions, which would prefer to have more freedom and flexibility to combat ailments that they find to be more, to place more of a burden on their populaces. So to what extent is country health in poor nations being overly dictated by, uh, by parties based in the West? A final point on that is that interestingly, even though Gates has offered a lot of support financially and both um, uh, culturally by speaking out on, on the need to emphasize polio, in a way, he, the foundation slightly punches above its weight in this sense because some people think, Gates is eradicating polio. But actually, the WHO, the Rotary Club, other bodies were as instrumental to the push. So if we do manage to achieve this accomplishment, which would be an accomplishment, it's something that a lot of people can lay claim to having played a big part in. And yet, ideologically, oddly, a lot of the acclaim tends to be attached to the Gates Foundation. And I think that speaks to your earlier point about what's different today surrounding the general cultural receptiveness to large-scale giving. Yeah, gotcha. Good. What, you're, in the course of answering that, you touched on a very interesting theme that, that runs throughout the book, and that is, uh, and you draw on some of my favorite uh, authors from political theory, but uh, also some recent folks like James C. Scott, uh, his magnificent book, Seeing Like a State. Uh, you make the point that uh, armed with these uh, top-down technological devices for uh, concocting solutions and planting solutions, uh, in, in localities that, that the price of that is that local communities are not consulted. That, and, and Pablo, I know this is a theme dear to Pablo. I see Bob Woodson in the audience who's someone else who's uh, very concerned about this whole issue. But the foundation, I mean, and of course, James C. Scott in Seeing Like a State attributes that to the state apparatus. But you make the case in the book, and I think persuasively, that uh, the foundation seems to be, uh, some of the larger foundations seem to be equally guilty of that, of that uh, problem of seeing like a state. And as you put it, uh, if I could find it very quickly, uh, you make the case that they, they see, they don't see very well. Uh, they, they're not even seeing as successfully as a state what they're trying to do. Maybe you could make a comment about that. I think the critique of centralized authority that can overestimate their ability to plan economic growth and to essentially have a sort of omniscient power is something that's interesting because it's a cross-partisan problem. And you've got useful critiques of central planners coming from both the right and the left. So Scott's um, 
more on the left of the political spectrum. But as I, as I tried to describe in the book, there's obviously been a long-standing right-leaning critique of centralized authority rooted in Austrian economics from people like Ludwig von Mies and Friedrich Hayek, whose road to serfdom, as well as in very influential essays like The Uses of Knowledge, talks about the fact that one thing a central planner lacks is access to dispersed knowledge and forms of information that proliferate throughout society and therefore that a market mechanism is able to essentially um, to, to gather and to therefore price processes and services and commodities more effectively. Scott, from a, a more of a far left perspective, then also applies a similar almost epistemological critique, a knowledge-based critique to large states, which he suggests can be sometimes hubristic in their ability to understand the knowledge base of local communities. In a strange way, I don't personally agree with Scott or Hayek. I think central planners can do a lot of good, and I think some of the evidence for that can be seen in the development of even, of even the U.S. government and the U.S. economy during the 19th century, where the American system was very much predicated on some interventionist policies by the government when it came to tariff policies, for example, infrastructure building. That was a good example of a centrally planned, not completely centrally planned, it had a strong space for the for market activities to flourish, which were also important, but there was a lot of government intervention. At the same time, it was an accountable body, not always probably perfectly accountable in practice, but in theory, it was democratically responsive to the, to the, to the desires of a populace. And my concern with the Gates Foundation is not as much that it's non-efficient because it's a central organizing body with a lot of clout placed in essentially the three trustees um, and pr primarily Bill and Melinda but also the third trustee who is Warren Buffett. It's accountable to no one other than those three trustees and I think as a large organization it can potentially do a lot of good but only if it's accountable and philanthropic foundations are by definition not accountable to any party outside themselves as long as they adhere to the rule of law. So that's my concern. Well, yeah. Let me, well, you mentioned the, uh, the Gates Foundation has basically a board of two. Warren Buffett is sort of like a shadow um, member and therefore are outside the political process and have, has no accountability to the community in its decision making. Now, not only do you have the Gates Foundation doing this, dispersing three billion bucks a year, but you have the Waltons, you have... Uh, Abroad, you have a, a growing number, and if the Boston College folks are correct, then we're going to have another 25 of these mega foundations run by two or three family members. I mean, this seems to me to be a threat to democratic institutions, particularly in public policy making, where if a Gates can have a major influence on American education policy, what can 25 Gateses do? to American policy in other fields. And yet, there's been almost no discussion among philanthropy, philanthropists, the nonprofit sector, umbrella organization nonprofits, about what this means for the future of this country. It's extraordinary that somehow we're not concerned. I, I, I'm curious what, how your take is. It. Why isn't there a concern about this uh, lack of access, lack of accountability, uh, involvement in the political process by an elite few. I mean, why, sh why isn't it the, the media doing, raising a storm, doing, saying anything about this? I think that's a really good question. I think there's a number of ways of responding to that. One is that there is a concern that I know some journalists are starting to query more effectively which is to what extent does the Gates Foundation's contributions to a vast array of both for-profit and non-profit media, to what extent does it, has a does it have a blanketing effect on public discourse and journalistic inquiry? As you mentioned, it's not simply, the Gates Foundation is simply one, of, one large foundation among many large foundations. And a number of foundations are increasingly giving direct non-repayable grants to both non-profit and a lot of for-profit media, which I think is concerning in a number of ways. Because a lot of, 
of for-profit media groups are highly profitable. Huh. Um, there's a lot of scrutiny. I think it was um, Bernie Sanders looks at sort of the, C, the, the executive salaries at large foundations, which I actually think is a bit of a misplaced concern because that's not the biggest problem, I think. They are high. Should they be that high? Maybe, maybe not. But my larger concern is that at a place like NBC or ABC, you have anchors making seven-figure salaries, and yet they're still holding out sort of charity begging basket to large foundations and saying, we need grants in order to cover and to, to report coverage of underfunded areas. And so I think that's a misplaced use of public money, particularly at a time of escalating poverty in the United States and widening economic inequality. I think for-profit media groups, to a large extent, should be footing their own bills. But the second, and I think possibly more important question, which Pablo is, I think, raising, is why has there been the silencing? Why isn't there more general interest or engagement with the question of whether philanthropic foundations actually do do enough to support the needs of the most marginalized in society, which is a chief criterion of, of charity or philanthropy? Why are we not doing enough to question whether or not there's too much um, influence over public policy setting by foundations. And one thing I've noticed as someone who came at this from a global health background is that the most engaged media outlets in the US, this won't be a surprise to all of you in the room, but it was a surprise to me. It's definitely at places like the Chronicle of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Quarterly, which are more specialized outlets that don't necessarily have the same clout and circulation of, say, the New York Times, but are certainly asking the harder hitting questions. And I think that's an interesting phenomenon, that you've got these specialized journals, which have, in a way, more to lose by bringing attention to problems in the nonprofit sector, and yet they're the ones willing to ask the toughest questions. Where's the New York Times? It, it, I, I think it's been largely not, not investigative enough. One, one question that, uh, I, if, if one were a conservative, one might look at this conversation and say, um, you know, the, the, the assumption is that somehow government, whether it's the United Nations or the United States government, would do better uh, with this money uh, than, than the, the foundations uh, are doing. Uh, and yet, I think it could be argued, if you were a conservative, that, uh, that government is not exactly the most accountable institution in our society today. And in fact, the, it's, it's becoming ever less, uh, in the eyes of the public, it's becoming ever less uh, respected and, uh, uh, you know, review, uh, ever less uh, accountable in, in the eyes of the public. And in fact, there's an awful lot of uh, political activity on the right and on the left um, in American uh, politics today based on this sort of distrust in, in major political institutions. So, you know, they would look, uh, folks on the far left and in the far right would look at this discussion and say, well, so the, the, uh, the, what, the alternative is to, to tax away Gates's money, give it to the government, and then see it spent in the way that all the money has been spent in the past, i.e. futilely and wastefully and even damagingly. Uh, what's the response to that? And Pablo might have a thought or two about that mm -hmm. since he's a big uh, uh, raise the tax guy. I know that he's all for big taxes. <laughs> But, but, Lindsay, you certainly can... I can't just throw that one over yeah, to Pablo. Yeah, no, 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 I can't do that. You're, you're the guest of honor, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab first, but I would oh. love Pablo's <laughs> views. I think that's a fair critique that's emerging. We are seeing a lot of um, inefficient practices, and not just inefficient, but corrupt and problematic, both do domestically um, and internationally. So you, you, in the past, had this argument that instead of the rich giving away on a whim, they sh could, should potentially, if they want to do the most good in a democratic society, be simply paying their taxes instead. This was a point made by Clement Attlee, who was the <laughs> British prime minister in 1945. And in 1920, years before he became prime minister, he said charity is a, a cold, gray thing. If a rich man wants to do the most good, he should pay his taxes 
willfully rather than give on a whim. And I think Atlee was largely proved right in that assertion for the, from the period from 1945 to about 1970-80 when the British welfare state produced huge gains when it comes to a narrowing of the gap between rich and poor, when it came to the institution, institutionalization of a very effective health service, which spends a lot less on a per capita basis on health care than the US, and manages to ch achieve a lot of comparable gains when it comes to life expectancy, when it comes to ensuring that the least well off and the richest both can share in the spoils of a wealthy nation when it comes to their own um, health, when it comes to good health outcomes. At the same time, I very much feel that current governments on the left and the right, particularly in the center space, which is um, a space that uh, a Marxist scholar in the U UK called Tarek Ali has called the extreme center, in the sense that it's the center itself that has now become so ideologically rid rigid and wedded to a sort of mantra of fiscal responsibility and social liberalism that it's really hard to contest that center space without seeming like um, an extremist in a way. So they're extreme in their own views, but criticisms of it are the criticisms that seem most radical. So I do think governments have a lot of answering for themselves to do currently. And the only thing I would say to a conservative who th thinks that philanthropy in some ways acts as a check on that non-accountability of governments is that currently you're seeing a lot more overlap between elites such as Gates, such as the Broad Foundation, such as the Walton family, with governments rather than acting as a critique of them. So that long-standing hope that philanthropy would be a check on power seems to be lost currently. It's a, it's a bulwark of power at the moment rather than um, an indictment of governmental largesse. Yeah. Pablo. <clears throat> why, why, do you, why do you think we should just tax all that money away? No, I, I, I don't believe that. I, th I think that there is a lot of waste in government. I think government doesn't do well in many areas. On the other hand, government, if it's going to deliver this type of services that we want, be it education, health, um, uh, Head Start, et cetera, has to have the revenue needed to provide those services. And that's where the conservatives don't seem to agree. They block the increase is all the time, with a vow that there should be no additional taxation, whatever. So you guys are willing to let our transportation, transportation system go to hell by not raising 18 cents more in tax per gallon um, to make the highways uh, fund viable. Now, what's ironic about the fact that government doesn't do well in many times is that philanthropy has constantly refused to finance watchdog organizations that could hold government institutions accountable. You've just had a miracle, the Center for Public Integrity, do a study of state governments, their ethical lapses, how they're not functioning well. Well, that's a terrific study, but there are other aspects of government that need to be looked at, held accountable. You cannot put philanthropic money into those watchdog organizations. So we have uh, lots of lapdogs, but very few serious watchdogs. And that is a real problem in our society. And what's interesting about the Gates Foundation is that much as it's bought off half the media in this country, particularly uh, over the Common Core standards, and works hand in hand with government institutions, particularly Arne Duncan uh, at the Department of Education. It has, and has a priority on global health, has never once took a, took a critical look at our American health system. It's extraordinary that a three billion a year foundation should not have looked at our totally inefficient health system. Our hospitals that don't deliver health care except at a huge profit and not for poor people, at the way doctors' uh, expenditures uh, hurt many of us. There's never been a look at that. It's almost as though our health system is beyond reproach. And yet, that's not been the case 
in its approach to diseases overseas. So uh, the question about many of these big foundations uh, to me is, when is it going to take a really critical look, not only at easily funded diseases overseas, where basically their, account, their actions are unaccountable, but take a look at our own health system and try to figure out, hey, maybe Obamacare wasn't the right thing, but perhaps we could have made a difference. They have not. And that's an extraordinary irony about some of the big foundations like uh, uh, Gates and Broad and Lumina and all the others around. Good, yeah. I, I, I can't let this moment pass without pointing out that a lot of the practices we're criticizing, namely foundations buying off uh, uh, favorable media, I mean, purchasing favorable media and so forth. This is all, this is not just an accident. I mean, this is all part of the, the theory of strategic philanthropy, right? right. I mean, a, a well-planned strategic initiative uh, funds the original idea, uh, funds the research that develops the idea, funds the experimental, uh, you know, spread of the idea to various locations, funds, and, and, you know, under the guise of, well, you know, if we've done this wonderful deed, we need to bring attention to it, then they go out and fund the coverage of this. So it's, it's sort of a, a closed loop, uh, and, and it's not, it, it is in fact a very well-planned closed loop. I mean, right, this is the essence of what, uh, of what sensible and wise strategic philanthropy is today. So well, let's... I have another yeah. question for... For Lindsay, the question is, can one democratize, or as you would say, maybe reform philanthropy, not only in accountability, but also access? I mean, how many of you in the audience have applied for a Gates Foundation grant or dealt with the more than 1,200 staff that are in Seattle? <laughs> I mean, have you, like me, come into a, a huge bureaucracy? It's very hard to get a proposal considered because they don't accept um, unsolicited proposals. How many of you also have tried to get access either to Bill or Melinda Gates or their advisory committees? Well, you can't. They are not accessible to us normal human beings. The head of the Ford Foundation can get an audience with Bill and Melinda, but those of us can't. And so, Again, is that a part? Is access to the big donors a, a failure of big philanthropy today? And how can we, can we change their boards? I mean, do you have any ideas about democratizing philanthropy, reforming them? And this, is, this is a point, incidentally, Pablo makes, and it's shocking to me, that the rise in the, in the percentage of, of foundations that no longer take unsolicited uh, grant proposals. You know, it's, yeah. That's really quite amazing. Anyway, sorry, go ahead, Lindsay, please. Well, no, I, I do think that's a key problem. And um, as Pablo's work shows, another scholar doing a, a lot of very important work on this is Gary Jenkins yeah. at Ohio State University, who's done, in, he's crunched some numbers in the most per, pervasive, like incredibly comprehensive way and shown that you've seen a, a massive decline in the number of large foundations that will still have an open door policy to unsolicited grant applications. So most of the large foundations now take the stance, as he puts it, don't call us, we'll call you. And that is done under the, under the pretext of increased efficiency, as Bill is pointing out. And I think the loss there is clearly the problem that, well, certainly in the global health field, the concern is that if you for some reason are on the wrong side of the Gates Foundation, if you have never received a Gates Foundation grant, a lot of people wonder what's wrong with your research because the foundation funds things so extensively that to not have the imprimatur of the Gates Foundation on your CV is seen as something of a black mark. And yet we don't know if some political reasons or, or partisan reasons might have been at root in the decision not to fund a grant from the first place. And that's not unique to the Gates Foundation that obviously politically motivated uh, tactics can affect which policies to fund or not. That's, that's the reality of, of, of most of life and that all forms of politics are generally present in a decision. But it's particularly problematic when a foundation is of the size of the Gates Foundation. 
and, and, and has such a bearing on the possible careers of individual researchers. This is why it's very hard to find independent critique of that organization. A point that's made by Sophie Harmon, a global health scholar who has pointed out that the lack of critical voices around the Gates Foundation doesn't really signal, as the media tends to assume, its legitimacy and its widespread acceptance. It's a sign of the opposite. It's a sign of an organization that's seen as so, that it's seen as so powerful that few dare reproach it. But you know what? You know what's interesting is we we now with the demise of a lot of daily, uh, daily newspapers and the decrease in the number of investigative reporters and editors, you've had the growth of independent um, centers for investigative journalism. You've had this big one, ProPublica, that was created and which does good research. But even ProPublica, uh, when I asked them, why don't you do any stories on nonprofits and philanthropy, said, it's not a direct quote, but it's a good paraphrase, <laughs> well, that would be a conflict of interest. And I said, well, why would that be a conflict? Well, we get money from foundations. And my response was, well, some of us have gotten big money from foundations and also been critics. Why can't you? Uh, there was no answer. So what, you have one of the major centers for investigative journalism, which does good work in the realm of politics, afraid to challenge the big boys in philanthropy. I mean, it's extraordinary. Where's the, I mean, we're really becoming a gutless society in lots of respects, but that's a prime example. You know, I just... And the media, I mean, generally, uh, why do journalists not ask the tough questions? It's not only, I'm, I, I'm saying that not only because in philanthropy and the nonprofits, but in politics as well. Uh, it's, uh, perhaps there needs to be a change in the schools of journalism, but it seems to me the investigative journalism is a key to holding the nonprofit sector and foundations accountable. It used to be that way before the demise of daily newspapers and uh, the existence of really tough publishers. But that's no longer the case, and it's a real, I think, a problem for mm -hmm. philanthropy. Yeah, one thing I think uh, Professor McGoey's book makes clear is that it was very different in the, with the rise of the Carnegie, you know, in the, in the very beginning mm -hmm. of this mega philanthropy right. trend. Uh, there was a vigorous mm. debate right. about the legitimacy, right, of these of these uh, institutions, and you know, in in some ways, since I guess the 50s, when they're, uh, well, the, I guess uh, probably the 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 agitation leading up to the tax uh, legislation of 69, that was really the last time we really had any kind of serious conversation about that. Mm -hmm. So that's that is an interesting difference. So, as I say, we have this wonderfully knowledgeable audience with us today, and so uh, I want to, unless Pablo has objections to <laughs> taking uh, questions from the audience, let's go to the audience and find out uh, what, what questions we have. There's Carol Edelman in the back. Do we have a... Ah, yes, we do. Good. Oh, yeah, please, please. Is it the case that this microphone is still terrible and that you need to talk right into testing, it? Testing, testing. Okay, good. Not ideal. That's good. <laughs> uh, talk into the microphone. Identify yourself and your affiliation, please. Carol I will. Edelman, I'm uh, Dr. Carol Edelman with the Hudson Institute, director of the Center for Global Prosperity. And I publish the um, Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances as well as an Index of Philanthropic Freedom. And um, I'd like to impart, since you came here to learn and gain some wisdom, I'd like to help you with some, some <laughs> wisdom and data, data at least. Um, to worry about the mega-rich becoming dominant in the field of global philanthropy in particular is, is a worry that has never bothered me. And I'll tell you why, because in our measures, and happy to share these data with you, they're on our website, uh, the foundations and the wealthy people who have started these foundations are about less than $5 billion of the $39 billion that just the United States sends over to the developing world. And about a third of that philanthropy is in health. So you do not, you, you have Bill Gates dominating the financial aspect of health, 
um, in, among foundations, but that's a very minor source. The bulk of that is coming from NGOs, both small, medium, and large, from individuals, and a huge amount, seven billion, from churches. In fact, half of the health care in Africa has been and uh, is, is provided by missionaries in Africa. And so as much as you love central planning, <laughs> Um, Africans do not because uh, they haven't got any health care services delivered from their corrupt and non-transparent governments. So leading to the fact that the missionaries are the ones there. So I think we have a lot of democratization of philanthropy. And I think as Dennis Whittle, the head of Global Giving, who has raised millions and millions of dollars just with online giving, has said we've had a we have ordinary Oprahs out there who are contributing to international causes, and we have had a, a, a big revolution in that. And I, the, my main thing, and, I'll, and then I, I don't want to dominate, but like the beggar rich, I want to say that um, you know there's it, it's sort of compared to what, and I, if you're trying to say well, you know governments can do better, just look at Africa, look at most other developing country governments. Anyone in this room who's dealt in global health, as I have for 30 years, you know, can never say that the governments do a better job than um, most individuals. Um, compared to what? Do multilateral institutions do better? Anyone following the WHO's record on e Ebola, it's been absolutely awful, and the whole executive committee was set up to decide, should we get rid of the WHO? because they did such a poor job on it. World Bank, every evaluation they've done points to failures in healthcare, so of their own projects by internal evaluation. So I would just say, compared to what? I mean, and I would submit that the smaller organizations I do know, because we follow, we write about them, they find local partners, they go with demand-driven projects where their dollar is not the only dollar on the table. And we've seen, uh, yes, there's plenty of mistakes, plenty of problems, and plenty of failures, but um, nothing so great as governments and central planning trying to, you know, take over people's lives. So I am less worried about the problem than you are, and be happy to hear your sure. comments on this new data. If hopefully it has informed you of something new. Um, on the data, no, it's not. I was familiar with the fact that philanthropic giving is a drop in the bucket compared to what governments spend on overseas development assistance. So. Um, Thank you. You reiterated a point that I discuss in my book, which is that because the foundations do proportionately give so much less towards overseas development assistance, it's strange that they play an outsized role in comp comparison to their giving when it comes to policy setting. So they punch about, above their weight when it comes to their own financial com contributions in comparison to cum cumulative giving by governments. Your point raises a number of very important and insightful arguments that I think are very important to address. So thank you for that very, very uh, important contribution. Do I love central planning? I'm a little agnostic on that. I just think it's a bit ironic that one of the best successes and best exemplars of a centrally planned economy is really the U.S., which was incredibly interventionist from its origins in the late 18th century, where Alexander Hamilton explicitly said, I like a, some of the things that Adam Smith's saying about a free market, but we are not there yet. So we need to have tariff controls. We need to have a lot of infrastructural development implemented by the state in order to get us to a place where we can compete intellectually. So I'm actually a bit agnostic on central governments, but I think the U.S., a very thriving economy, I'm sure we can all agree, is a fairly good example of a government system that has a lot of intervention that that did grow its economy quite effectively that way. As for uh, your points about African nations, I think they're a bit generalist, to be honest. I think there are some concerns surrounding corruption in different nations. But as for the entire health system being problematically uh, a, a problem of the deterioration of the economy itself, African nations when they managed to win after quite strong struggles for, for independence from some of their, I'm not being, I, I'm not being at all uh, political here when I just simply point out that it was only in 1950 and 60 that they won independence from their imperial, uh, imperial uh, uh, 
nations that were essentially subjecting them to colonial rule. So Ghana, for example, obtained independence from Britain in the late 1950s, and it set about trying to implement a similar nationally subsidized healthcare system that the UK government had implemented under Attlee. It then thrived as much as possible as one of the, some of the largest health gains were seen in the 1960s and 70s in Ghana until spiraling under the weight of an international debt crisis that affected many people, many people here from the 70s, obviously from their own domestic lives, remember long lineups at gas tanks, remember the crisis that affected the international economy. And that debt crisis had a huge effect on developing regions. Under the auspices of IMF conditionality pro programs and prescriptions from lenders like the World Bank and IMF, they were forced to dismantle health systems in a way that had a very deleterious effect on populations. So was that an imposition and a problem of a government body? Yes. The I, an international government organization, which was the IMF, which is, as we know, has its largest voting base in the United States. So I, I don't in any way think that government is entirely part of the solution, but I, nor do I Am I as, as sanguine about the role played by actors like the World Bank and IMF and private donors like the Gates Foundation? Yeah, and Carol, I think, I think part of the, uh, it, it's not just toting up the numbers and comparing. I think uh, that, you know, an individual donor, and, and Lindsay's book gets to this point, um, she, she makes the case that you know, turning, turning, uh, giving a gift and turning loose, you know, turning loose of it, mm -hmm. you know, simply giving a gift and that's, that's the, the end of it is, is a valuable thing, but that's not the way the mega foundations approach things. I mean, they, they, want to, they want to use their contributions, however small compared to the larger contributions of individuals, They're, they set about to use their contributions to leverage, right, the, uh, to, to a maximum degree, uh, the influence of, of other dollars. I mean, that again is, an, is a, a particular uh, a stratagem of strategic philanthropy. That's, uh, that's the, you know, the more you can leverage other people's do dollars, the better. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's no accident that these large foundations end up playing a fairly outsized role because that, they explicitly set out to do that. That's, that's best practices for, for, for foundations. Bob Woodson. Bob Woodson, uh, Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Uh, another issue that I haven't heard discussed is to what extent do these large foundations drive the behavior of smaller foundations community foundations in these cities. And uh, let's drill down in Baltimore for four years, the Gates Foundation sponsored an education reform effort that just attracted millions of dollars. Uh, and they went into high crime, uh, underperforming schools. And they decided, along with their experts, that they'll take a large school and separate it into four sub-schools and the parents on the third level will be a part of a science academy and wear uniforms. So each of the parents spent 128,000 uniforms. And they were beaten up by the kids on the other floors. So then after a week, they said, well, we're going to discontinue that. And the whole experiment collapsed. In the meantime, the schools continued to be dysfunctioning. But also, it meant that innovative remedies that were in place informally were ignored not only by the Gates Foundation, but it also ignored by the local foundations. They considered prestigious to partner with the Gates Foundation. This is happening all over the country. Yeah, you have a, uh, Lindsay has a terrific chapter in the book about, about this, this issue, the, the fact that uh, uh, the, the education uh, you know, the education scene is profoundly influenced. And again, I mean, it's, it's a remarkable case, you know, the, as Melinda Gates points out, you know, the, the, what the Gates Foundation gives is this very tiny uh, portion of the, of the state education budget of California. And yet, you know, we all know, right, that there is this massively disproportionate influence. But what, say, it, it's, a, it's a terrific uh, uh, 
question for ex exactly what you've been talking about in your book. Okay. Please. Well, and I, thank you. And I'd love to hear Pablo's views on that, too, because I think he's done such important work looking at community foundations and, and grassroots organizations that are trying to, in some ways, dislodge the, the uh, in some ways, absolute power of some of these larger players. Thank you for that wonderful question. I mean, I'm fascinated because I'm, I'm on the left. I, you know, those are my political, that's my political bias. And this week I happened to be with a few other leftists on a panel and I heard teachers speak for one of the first times. I've interviewed a number, but living in the UK, I have not been able to witness firsthand just the sheer influence of some of these small school initiatives on education policy and what it's like to, to live in a classroom and to try to teach and enthuse your teacher, your students, when you are dealing with these type of constant changes to, to, to institutional size. And she mentioned that she was in one of these smaller school academies and that rather than essentially uh, in any ways disperse some of the problems surrounding large bureaucratic organization, they simply took a school and divided it into all these smaller entities that, that caused a proliferation of administrative uh, reporting problems and, 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 and requirements. And it's, she, she, she and her, another colleague of hers, it was very insightful to hear them. And I think the problem you point to is very, is very pervasive and needs attention. Well, let me add to that because I think Lindsay was referring to the, the small high school program that the Gates Foundation initiated long ago without consulting teachers, without consulting communities, and decided that you, you break up schools into smaller high schools, you get better results. Well, after th four or five years, they suddenly realized that it didn't work, so they abandoned the project. Same thing with the uh, Common Core Standards. They poured in hundreds of millions of dollars into state superintendents, into state governments, into media to push for the Common Core without preparing teachers, without having decent tests. And then they suddenly realized it didn't work, so they backtracked and said, oh, we're not going to do it anymore. And it's sort of like the old cartoon of the high wire um, performers, and one, one uh, of the performers jumps off and the person who's supposed to catch her doesn't. And he looks down at, at the plummeting body and says, oops, sorry. Well, <laughs> that's what, in fact, Gates has been saying to the poor people <laughs> they've left behind in some of these failed things. So there, as Bill has repeatedly, and you too, Bob and Lindsay mentioned, consultation, talking to people, involving a broader planning uh, process and being in touch with community people is essential. Unfortunately, that's what many foundations, not only the big ones, totally lack. They listen to their own inner ear, and that's not good enough. And that's certainly one of the reasons they're not putting a lot of money into poor people. I mean, you look, as you've documented, the percentage of money that foundations give to nonprofits that are associated with poverty or race or uh, disabled or marginalized constituencies is probably five to seven percent when in fact these constituencies are a majority of the population of this country and until that changes philanthropy is not really fulfilling its role of attacking inequality now darren walker a fine president of Ford Foundation, one of the few really good appointees to a big foundation we've seen in years, has said they're going to attack inequality and put all its money in. Well, we've yet to see that, and yet I think that's the challenge that our big foundations really face. How to not, how not to further inequality, which they're currently doing, but reducing inequality. And that's a, that's a very difficult thing. As, as, uh, as Bob's question suggested, one of the difficulties is, and, and Pablo was referring to it as well, you, know, you would hope that small local foundations would have the courage to say to a Gates Foundation, uh, 
Um, you know, you know, you guys, we have some really good things underway here that we've been supporting for a long time. Why don't you look at what we're doing before you? Well, of course, that's not at all the way small local foundations. They, the, you know, the the staff people look at each other and say, "We're going to leverage a Gates Foundation grant." You know, that we're going, so we're going to be able to go to our board and show how our, you know, our piddly little grant actually. Uh, got ten times the amount of money here for you know this project uh, from the Gates Foundation, but and so everyone is leveraging everybody else. You know, leverage is the name of the game. So you know, Gates is leveraging local money. Local money is leveraging Gates. Everyone is happy in this leveraging game, uh, except for, of course, the small little reform efforts that are underway. Often, the the new book uh, on the Zuckerberg grant in uh, uh, Newark, the prize. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because it, it talks about, uh, you, you know, the, the sort of the advent of this multi-million dollar grant from Zuckerberg, which, which if it had been spent wisely and look, looking at some of the individual schools where teachers were getting together and actually putting together some very thoughtful local reform efforts, it might have done some good. But of course, it, it was completely reliant on the top-down technocratic a technique of the James C. Scott seeing like a state uh, high modernist uh, uh, project. Anyway, we've got to have someone here. We uh, sure maybe we have someone here from the Gates Foundation or someone who is a friend of the Gates Foundation who would love to ask the question that will knock uh, critics of the Gates Foundation's back on their ear. Uh, please, someone. With that, with that. Uh, otherwise, we'll just have to. Yes, pl yes. Here, please. Thank you. Um, my name's Karen Hyman. I'm from the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and been blown into Washington, D.C. and the world of the think tanks for a couple of months, which is very fortunate. Um, I'd like to ask a question of the panel um, as to whether there are corresponding changes in our democracy, cultural, moral, spiritual, that account for the weakness of a democratic response. Um, is there a growing culture of expertise such that everybody, you know, holds up the results or the conclusions of two experts in a foundation as um, inarguable conclusions? Um, are there religious changes that we feel um, we can't stand before these foundations and make um, arguments? Is there something going on culturally that you could um, that you could speak to? Thank you. Yeah, Lindsay, why don't you take a fling at sure, it? Sure, I think that's a really good question. A really good question. I I've been personally thinking that, about that a lot recently, and I don't think some of my <coughs> thinking emerges that extensively in the book. Actually, on a new direction that I hope to explore a little bit in future, but I'll try to be briefer. Two two quick responses. I think there's a regime of evaluation and measurement that has grown up, that has uplifted technical expertise to a level of almost sanctity that it didn't hold necessarily to the same extent as before. So although the strategic emphasis is not new in philanthropy, it was, I think, novel to the early, late 19th and early 20th century, it's become much more entrenched in a way that we possibly didn't simply have the evaluative tools to make it as central as it has become today. And this. I think can be seen in the rise of randomized controlled trials that are held up as a gold standard way to evaluate any policy intervention. The downside of this new trend, I think, is that we've, but we've, we've, we've seen the rise of what I think of as the tyranny of small measurement. This is where things that are amenable to be studied through a trial which can compare two elements in order to control for variables, in order to see whether there's a causal effect of a new intervention is leading us to prioritize things that are amenable to the amenable to the technique itself, rather than asking more large macro questions surrounding what is the relationship between philanthropy and growing wealth inequality. That's a very macro question that's very hard to determine and that we don't have a clear response to. Because to analyze that question, you would have to really have a much more solid global database of giving over time that we've got some data on, but not as, as much data as we need to answer the inequality question. 
So the type of work that Thomas Piketty, the French economist, has done recently in Capital in the 21st century, taking together various different large-scale databases and drawing on tax revenue information in a way that earlier scholars of inequality didn't do as extensively, I'd like to see some of the effective altruists, the new school focused on measurement and philanthropy, actually become a lot more ambitious at trying to turn their gaze and their interest in measurement towards more macro evaluations of the relationship between giving, a decline, if this is the case, in democratic uh, participatory uh, interest in politics, but that doesn't seem the case because obviously we have seen a rise of a populist politics, which is, I think, quite important in many ways. But measuring the effectiveness and the impact of these new policies needs more macro attention, and it's been a micro turn in the policy world versus a macro turn. Well, stated bluntly, there is, there is no system of, of rigorous evaluations of foundations for all their desires to see their nonprofit grantees be subject to metric evaluations and numbers, they have never turned the light of evaluation on themselves. And no matter what sort of intermediary nonprofits say that they really do some evaluations, they're fairly soft. But I haven't seen one foundation hire an independent group of evaluators with no self-interest to conduct a rigid evaluation of itself, including the big issues um, that Lindsay has talked about. So we don't have a serious assessment of how well foundations, large and small, conduct themselves. I mean, it seems to me clear that there's not going to be any reform in philanthropy, in the big foundations, whether it's access, accountability, uh, democratic uh, uh, boards of directors, more diverse boards of directors, until you have the public pressure to make change. And thus far, we do not have anywhere near that demand from the public for philanthropy to change. We don't have it among nonprofits. We don't have it among even the watchdog nonprofits. We don't have it among philanthropists themselves. The public doesn't care. Academics are really sort of scared to speak out, usually. And it's going to be very tough. And it's going to take also political efforts. So nonprofits lobbying the Congress and the Senate Finance Committee to hold foundations accountable, to make reforms, to insist that they have diverse boards that are not just family members, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see that happening soon. Uh, and the big question among all people is the lack of one characteristic in today's society, and that is the lack of courage. Look at any sector. We don't have courageous leadership. And unless we have courageous leadership and the willingness to tackle tough problems, particularly in philanthropy, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're going to have much of a change. Although I don't mean to be totally pessimistic, but uh, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel in terms of change? I think pessimism is needed because we are in a situation of extremely alarming uh, rises in poverty in some of the world's wealthiest nations. Why is that the case? You have massive wealth in the U.S., but it's not trickling down. No. So this needs to be uh, challenged and, and, and exposed in an important way. So Mr. Gates calls himself an impatient optimist. I'd rather call myself personally a, cautious, uh, a very a patient pessimist and that it might take time. And I, Walter Benjamin sort of talked about the, 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 the hopefulness of a sufficiently realistically pessimistic analysis that could lead to um, a radical solution when needed. So the hopefulness of pessimism. So pessimism isn't always, I think, a negative chance to have it can sometimes be a realistic one that talks about the need to appraise things as candidly as you can in any situation. And I'm sure there's things my, my book is, didn't cover and is lacking in many ways, but it's building on the work of Bill and Pablo, 
Mike Edwards, Ray Madoff, who's looking at donor advised funds in an important way and suggesting that maybe now's the time for another congressional push that we haven't seen, certainly since 1969, and certainly not since the Walsh Commission was set up by Woodrow Wilson to call to account the, lar the, the incredible influence and, and monopolistic practices of organizations like Standard Oil and Carnegie's uh, steel conglomerate. So the kind of points Pablo raises are similar to the things Woodrow Wilson raised. This is a point I make in the book, and yet there's no appetite in Congress for investigating things that congressional predecessors saw as their duty to investigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, um, my response to this, to this question would be um, to pick up where Lindsay was talking, the, the, the regime of metrics and, and uh, um, measurement and outcome and so forth and so on, which is sort of an outcry. It, it's just the immediate uh, cutting edge of a larger regime of, of uh, uh, technocratic dominance, I think. And that's why James C. Scott, I think, is so valuable as a critic of this, uh, what he calls high modernism, the notion that somehow we'll solve our problems uh, and we'll solve them once and for all. I mean, this is very important that we're going to be able to uh, cut to the core, to the root cause of a problem and eliminate them once and for all. Uh, through the application of technocracy. It's no accident, I think, that vaccines are so attractive to uh, uh, modern global philanthropists because it, a vaccine really does solve the problem once and for all. You know, you get the vaccine, it's inexpensive, it saves a life, uh, and it lasts for a very long time, if not forever. So if, if only all problems were like vaccines uh, or were like the things that vaccines uh, cured, then we would, uh, you know, be in pretty good shape. But of course, they're not. Most of our problems involve human beings and the way they act with each other, interact. Uh, and, and technocratic manipulation of human relationships is a, is a very difficult thing. And, and I think it does finally, you know, when, when we've had periods of political resistance uh, against foundations, it, 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 it really has come from both the left and the right, and it's been of a populist character, right? I mean, sometimes the, the, the Walsh Commission was a reflection of, of a kind of a leftist populism. Um, the, uh, the, the folks in the 50s and Wright Patman in the 60s, that was a more of a kind of a conservative populism. Uh, but when populism is running high, foundations sooner or later find themselves in the, in the crosshairs. Now, they've, we have a, a pretty high populist tide right now, at least within the Republican Party. Uh, and it has, you know, focused on the media. It's found various targets that are, that are uh, of interest. So far, it hasn't focused on foundations. So it'll be interesting to see if sooner or later uh, foundations drift into the, into the crosshairs. And I think it could happen if you see uh, massive, you know, again, part of the state-of-the-art philanthropic uh, uh, practice is influencing politics, right? I mean, this was something that, that Rockefeller was deathly afraid of is in, in the beginning, Rockefeller, uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr., uh, uh, thought about bringing on Mackenzie King to examine the industrial conditions that uh, are surrounding the Ludlow massacre and so forth. But the, pop, the, the, the political outcry was such that he backed off that, and the Rockefeller Foundation was very careful about venturing into politics. Now we've completely forgotten that caution about the, the involvement in, with uh, politics. And in fact, as I say, it's become very important to show that you can affect politics, that this is part of the, the measurable outcomes that foundations seek. Someone is stepping over the line, probably right now. May, you know, maybe the Clinton folks, maybe someone on the right, I don't know. But someone right now is doing something out there that's going to come to light uh, in the course of the campaign or after the campaign, the political campaign, that is going to highlight uh, the degree of, of elitist uh, insulation and manipulative uh, 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 attitude toward American politics. And uh, 
I don't know. We'll see. It might, it, mm -hmm. This may be one of those issues that's a sleeper for foundations until suddenly something springs up, like the Boston, uh, the Boston Globe investigation of foundations several years ago, the, the Cabot Foundation uh, 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 with the, the president using his um, you know, foundation to, to, you know, to buy his daughter's wedding and so forth. Something like that is happening in the political realm. So we're going to, I, I think we should brace ourselves for, for that kind of event. Yeah, John, please. Um, John Fonte, Hudson Institute. Um, to what extent is the Gates Foundation itself? Um, John Fonte, Hudson Institute. Um, to what extent is the Gates Foundation itself sort of an example of what we'd call what Bill's just been talking about, technological liberalism in the sense it's it has an ideological focus. Um, Matthew Continetti writing for the Washington Beacon talked about uh, Bloombergism, sort of uh, wealthy donors coming in, setting the agenda. And this could be a lot of areas, Common Core is one, uh, gun control. Uh, uh, it could be a whole range of, of issues where um, uh, immigration, uh, where the elites are deciding that certain things should be done. And Gates, as you've discussed up there, seems to be in opposition to a populist left and a populist right or anything uh, to the right of them. So it seems in a way that they themselves are, are I mean, they, they think of themselves as pragmatists or technologists, but to what extent are they themselves ideological? They'd be example we could call tech, sort of a techno-liberalism. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good question. Um, a new Republic article came out recently that suggested it was actually a review of my book, and it was a very astute, very fair review. I thought it was excellent in many respects. But it suggested that a main goal of my book was to suggest that the Gates Foundation and Gates himself is in some way trying to profit personally from his philanthropic investments. That's not a point I'm trying to make. I think the title is sensationalist enough and polemical enough that it's a very fair point to take from my book, but I don't personally believe that. I think the surging emphasis on technology in schools is certain to benefit inevitably a number of software manufacturers, but Gates himself has divested of a lot of Microsoft stock, and I don't think he is personally positioning himself to profit individually from his bequest. That said, he is a firm proponent of any number of the new neologisms that are used to describe this new form of capitalism. Creative capitalism, philanthro capitalism, venture philanthropy, philanthro entrepreneurism. There's too many new catchy phrases for trying to talk about essentially something that is the same thing, which is an effort to apply the tools of technical expertise to philanthropic giving to render it more efficient, but also to apply the profit motive to giving. Gates, I think what is very distinctive about the Gates Foundation, and I think personally, could be one of the incendiary problems that Bill is suggesting, and I think a very compelling point that is flying under the radar right now, but, it, it, but will possibly explode in future. An a aspect of his giving that I think is very ideologically, but almost masquerades under this air of impartiality, is the direct grants he is giving to some of the world's most lucrative and well-endowed corporations. He's given money to MasterCard to set up a lab for financial innovation in Nairobi, and MasterCard is not obligated to repay that grant regardless of how profitable it ends up being for the company. It was not a program-related investment. It wasn't a loan. It wasn't an equity stake. It was just a hands-off freebie to one of the largest companies in the world. MasterCard is just one of dozens of companies that have been receiving these non-repayable grants. And I think that's problematic because it's done not to benefit Gates personally. I really don't think that. It's done because I think of his ideological belief that benefits will inevitably trickle down if these corporations are endowed and imbued with philanthropic grants. Corporate philanthropy is shifting, where it's not just corporations giving money away. It's them receiving charity for some of the wealthiest, largest foundations. And I think that's an ideological shift that I personally object to. Yeah, Pablo, did you have something? Well, <clears throat> I think he's also ideological in his investment policy. As you know, he's been criticized heavily for investing in major corporations that pollute, that hurt the environment, 
contrary to the mission of the foundation, when he was faced with this criticism, he said, I will not change. I want the maximum return on my investments, not realizing that, that some social investments make good returns on investments. So he's been very rigid on that issue and won't change. Yeah, I think Lindsay's point is, is uh, again, it's the, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something that Bill Gates runs away from or any of these, uh, any of these folks described by the neologisms, uh, neologisms, the new words that we apply uh, to these folks. Uh, it's, the, these folks are proud of the fact, right, that they're, that they're straddling the sectors, right? I mean, the whole point of this new approach is uh, just using uh, charitable gifts is old fashioned. Now, now we're mobilizing the free market to accomplish social purposes and so forth. And, you know, of course, we're, we're bringing in uh, government as well into this partnership. But nothing, nothing is really being done today in this area that doesn't straddle all the sectors and have these grand consortiums and so forth all working together. But as you suggest, the question is, uh, you know, is in the final analysis, when you bring self-interest uh, to the table in this way, uh, is it in fact concealing itself beneath these public purposes? Is there in fact something else going on? In the same way that technology is sort of, I mean, this gets to John, uh, John Fonte's point, you know, the, the technology uh, masquerades as being ideology free, you know, uh, apolitical. It's above, it's above politics. Uh, if you resort to ideology, it's, or, uh, to, I'm sorry, to technology, uh, it's, it's somehow uh, trans idea, ideological. But of course, uh, that's not the case at all, it, it, you know, the, that reliance on technology arose at a certain time in American political history or uh, American world history. Uh, and carries a heavy ideological uh, uh, imprint. Anyway, one more question. Yes, please. Here, here comes the microphone. Sure, thanks. Hi, thanks, and I'm looking forward to reading the book, though I haven't yet. Uh, I'm a physician. I've been working in Sub-Saharan Africa for about 25 years, and most recently I run a software company that's based in Nairobi, Kenya. So I've been quite familiar with the actions of the Gates Foundation and also observing technology here and especially in poor countries. One of the things I'd like to offer just as a, a countervailing or maybe mitigating circumstance uh, to the actions of the Gates Foundation and what you're describing is that, uh, as people probably have noticed, or maybe you haven't, um, you know, in the last 20 years, technology has become radically less expensive. And what this has meant is that in poor countries especially, but I would imagine, I don't know, I imagine it's the same for the poor here in the United States. That means that capacities that used to require, for example, in Kenya, a grant from the Gates Foundation to use, um, now no longer do. Uh, just one example, 20 years ago, to have distance communications in Kenya, you would have needed to have a very expensive satellite phone system, and you would have needed to apply for and convince something like the Gates Foundation to give you the money for that. Now you use a $5 mobile phone to do the same thing. Last time when I was in Kenya, a couple months ago, my driver from the airport had an iPhone 5 a computer which is the equivalent of a Cray supercomputer from the 1970s in every respect. People are able to access things like Google Documents, uh, use things like Mint.com and all sorts of tools. Uh, now Uber is all over Nairobi as well. <laughs> things that, that, again, previously would have been very centralized and would have required huge grants in order to be able to do this. Now the Gates Foundation is still funding huge technological projects left and right, most of which have the results that you guys have described. but Small organizations all around the world now can do what they want to do, and they don't have to do it with a grant from the Gates Foundation or anyone else because it's just much cheaper. So why are they? Why is MasterCard a deserving recipient of $11 million to I, no set idea. up a new lab? That's my concern, and it's, it's actually in this point a conservative critique. This is where I think the most incisive criticisms come from the right because this is a, cor a corruption of free enterprise. This is a... a private subsidy that acts like a public subsidy. And I think it's not warranted, and I think it's a perversion of open competition rather than a uh, perpetuation of a free market. Well, there's... Yeah, we need, we need that. Can we get the microphone, please? 
relative relatively late in coming into uh, philanthropy because I've been working in corporate social responsibility. Um, the, the question is, uh, a significant question is now the role of the corporation and how the corporation has grown. So my suggestion on that, I don't agree with what they've done, but if you go into why not use a vehicle like MasterCard that can help you accomplish what you want to do and you can't buy them so you pay for them. My, my question, though, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. I'll read your book. I hope I'll, maybe it's in there. I'm trying to understand motivation. So when you look at Carnegie, uh, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, they were motivated either by a sense of a sin, because they weren't doing what they should do, guilt, or a sense of trusteeship. And now I'm struggling to understand when you look at Gates and Buff, Buffett and a variety of other people, do they have the same orientation toward philanthropy as trustees and therefore they have to get involved in this to help shift the nature of society except we don't see them we see the the foundations why don't you why don't you take that as your final that's a good question why don't we take that as the final question and Pablo you can chime in no, as well but Lindsay why don't Lindsay, you why don't you uh, love to hear Pablo's thank you I think that's a really good question it's always hard to determine someone's motivation. I mean, I can't pretend to have any specialist insight into how Mr. Gates thinks, for example, and I'm not going to claim to. But I think he would see himself, much like Carnegie, as a trustee, as a, uh, an individual who's been um, blessed with great wealth and wants to steward it in a way that is beneficial for the wider community. And here, I think, again, the 19th, whether you, you, that's, and I think that's a persuasive claim and belief that a lot of people subscribe to. I gravitate more personally to Oscar Wilde's criticism of that belief, which was that it was essentially paternalistic. And in a way, the claim of Carnegie's that the rich should steward wealth in a way that was far better than the community could decide for itself, which is a quote, it's a paraphrase of a comment he makes in the Gospel of Wealth. And Wilde responded, well, why should the rich be grateful for crumbs that fall from a rich man's table? They should be seated at the board and are beginning to know it. So that's the tension, I, I think, that is raised by your comment and by this question of should they be a trustee of the poor or should the poor be trustees of their own lives? Pablo. Well, again, I think that that's a question that is at the heart of the problem of lack of criticism or lack of access to Mr. and Mrs. Gates. No one's asked him that question. None of us have been able to get to him. And the journalists that have interviewed him have been patsies. They haven't really put him to the task of answering that question, which I'm sure he would be delighted to do so. But we don't know because there's so little access to Bill and Melinda Gates and, and to the many other big foundation or big uh, donors. Yeah, good. Well, we're out of time. So thank you uh, for coming and let's give our panel a, a round. <laughs>